So let's consider a sample that looks like this. It could be made out of any material, be it a ductile material like certain types of steel or brittle material like cast iron. And we take the sample and we load it into a machine and we pull upward on the top and we pull downward on the bottom because the two ends are clamped into the machine. To figure out how and when this material might break, I want to figure out all of the stresses acting on the material, let's say, in the region I've circled right there. And let's define some coordinate axes. We'll say y goes straight up, x acts along the width of the sample, and the z-axis acts normal or coming out of the face of the sample. Here I've drawn the sample with the x-axis to the right, the y-axis upward, and the z-axis acting straight out at us. And the machine applies a force in the upward direction at the top of the sample and in the downward direction in the bottom of the sample. When I look at it, it's intuitive to me that the material is under a normal stress, and we typically we use a value sigma for that. We would say that sigma is equal to the force divided by the area. In the area we define, let's just make a hypothetical cut straight across, we'll say that it has a width A and a depth B into the screen. So that area is then A times B. Here's another way to look at it. The area we're talking about is in red, and you know, I've got this dimension A and this dimension B. This cut right here is hypothetical. There's nothing that prevents us from making a cut that might be 15 degrees or 30 degrees or 45 degrees, 60 degrees, or even 75 degrees. We call these angles theta. And we're allowed to use whatever value of theta that we want because these cuts, they're, they're hypothetical. They're all in our heads. But do consider what happens to the area that we're dealing with. This theta becomes larger and larger. The area that we're cutting is much larger. And in fact, when theta approaches 90 degrees, this cut would approach infinity, assuming that the sample was infinitely tall. Another thing to consider is that the force of the machine clamped to the lower end of this all acts straight downwards. So we have the same force acting downward in all three cases. And in the case on the left, where theta is equal to zero, the force acts straight up or normal to this surface. And if we took that force again and divided it by the cross-sectional area, we get the normal stress, we'll call it sigma. If I make a hypothetical cut with some non-zero value of theta, the net force has to act upward on the upper face of the uh, lower half of the sample. If it didn't, it would suggest that the sample was accelerating left or right or even rotating if there was a net moment. And what that means then is that there has to be a component of the force that acts tangential to the surface and a component of the force that acts normal to our surface. And we'll call these two components V and N. Let's examine a situation in which theta is equal to 30 degrees, where again I've got my net upward force equivalent to the force acting downward, and I'll decompose this into the normal and shear components. Keep in mind that we've arbitrarily defined our y-axis in the direction parallel to the force, and our x-axis in the direction perpendicular to the force. There's nothing preventing me from drawing axes in these directions, or perhaps rotated even more. For example, we could start with the original x and y axis horizontally. Now we'll rotate it a value of theta 30 degrees counterclockwise. There's nothing special about 30 degrees either. We could keep rotating it, and eventually we'll hit theta equals 90 degrees. And at this point, the x prime axis is now what used to be the y axis. We've rotated the whole axis 90 degrees counterclockwise. So let's introduce some notation. We've got sigma y, which is equal to the normal force divided by the original cross-sectional area. And this is normal force is a times b, where a is the width and b is the depth into the screen. And because this is when theta is equal to zero, when the, the cut is horizontal, the normal force is simply equal to the force in the machine divided by a times b. So I'll write theta equal to zero up here. And when theta is equal to zero, there is no component in the horizontal direction. When the, the slice is horizontal, v is equal to zero, but we could use some notation tau y x, which is the shear stress, is equal to v divided by a. And that's equal to zero simply because v is equal to zero when theta is zero. So now let's do the cut when theta is equal to 30 degrees. We're now interested in the normal stress acting in the y prime direction we'll call this sigma y prime, and that's going to equal the force acting normal to the cut surface divided by a prime, where a prime is now the larger area due to the cut. And we'll do the same thing for the transformed shear stress, so tau y prime x prime is equal to the shear force divided by a prime. And the a prime by geometry, the new area, is equal to the original area divided by the cosine of theta.
And what we talked about originally is if as we increase this value of theta, the surface area gets larger and larger. And in the limit of theta equal 90 degrees, the surface area would become infinite, provided the sample was infinitely large. And we could look at it geometrically as well. As theta approaches 90 degrees, a cosine of 90 goes to 0, and a prime goes to infinity. And because a prime is so large when theta approaches 90 degrees, this means that sigma y prime approaches 0, because a is in the denominator, and tau y prime x prime also approaches 0. What's interesting about this is when theta is equal to zero, the shear stress is zero. And when theta is some intermediate value, the shear stress is some intermediate value. And when theta approaches 90 degrees, the shear stress again becomes zero, simply because the surface area is so large. And if we graph the, the stresses as a function of theta, what we'll find is sigma y prime is originally largest at theta equals zero for that horizontal cut. And sigma y prime decays to zero when theta approaches 90 degrees because that area is so large. However, tau y prime x prime is it actually reaches a maximum in this situation at theta equals to 45 degrees. And this angle of 45 degrees has huge consequences for ductile materials, which tend to fail in directions in which the shear stress is a maximum. And the fact that the normal stress is largest, where theta equals zero, has huge consequences for brittle materials, which tend to fail along directions in which the normal stress is a maximum. But keep in mind that the material we're dealing with, the material doesn't know if we've defined 45 degrees in this direction or if we've defined 45 degrees in this direction. And when you pull apart a ductile material, what you tend to see is a 45 degree angle in essentially all three directions, or we see a cup and a cone type failure, as shown by these pictures right here. So this is a ductile material, and this is a brittle material. And note that it's this angle right here that's about 45 degrees in all directions. So there's some symmetry involved with ductile materials, and here we see the cup. These angles here are right about 45 degrees when it fails. And brittle materials fail at theta equals 0 degrees because the normal stress is maximized at theta equals 0. So for brittle materials, we see a fracture going straight across. For ductile materials, we tend to see failure at about a 45 degree angle.